we have um, everyone's favorite presenter here today, Belinda Doolin, who's going to just review some some stuff with us um, that we've all gone through in our um, mediation training. But it's always good for her to present those to us and give us an opportunity to kind of knock them around and see what's working and what's not working. Let me just see if there's any other person that joined. So Kate Harris, nice to see you. I know I'm going to meet you at an observation next week. So I look or soon. So look forward to that. Kate is a new mediator. So Kate, if you want to say hello. Hi, folks. Uh, it's good to be here. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And another relatively new mediator, Lavana Aronson. Hi, Lavana. Nice to see you. Hi. She, I, Lavana has finished her observations and is ready to start jumping in as a mediator. So nice to see you. And then Cheryl, um, I don't know you all. Um, Cheryl's also going through her observations. So welcome to you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. Folks will be seeing her. And uh, Raya, hope to see you at some mediations as well. Yeah, I start observation on the 29th. Oh, good. good. Excellent. Wonderful. Okay, that, is there anything anybody wants to share before I turn it over to Belinda? Nope. Um, oh, Greta is sharing something. Marcus Aurelius says, beginning each day telling yourself, today I will be meeting with interference, ingratitude, insolence, disloyalty, ill will, and selfishness. Be, it, be, it, be amazed when you aren't. Aren't is what it's supposed to be. Yeah. I was trying to edit that and fix it, and I sent it instead. <laughs> I mean, I have that actually on um, tape to my wall because it kind of, it makes me smile whenever I see it. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much, Greta. All righty, Belinda, take it away. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good af almost afternoon. It's wonderful to be here and to see all of you and happy to see some of our newer mediators um, getting into uh, the fold of what we do here at the DRC. So thank you for being here, uh, being on the Zoom at our Lunch and Learn. Um, I was asked to, I, I don't know how this came about, Gail, I, I, my recall is not so sh not always so sharp, but I think we were just having a general conversation around techniques or uh, in a staff meeting or maybe one-on-one, -on -one, just talking about things that are happening um, in the mediation Zoom space. Um, given that we do so much of our work on Zoom, I don't get a chance to see mediators the way that I would like. I might, I'll meet you if you come to our training that I may not ever see you again. So um, unless I come to the lunch and learn. Um, but one of the things that the trade-offs with this new virtual approach to our services is that I don't get a chance to interact with mediators the way that I once did um, and having a pulse on how the work is working for you and what might be missing from our training or our lunch and learn series or any or otherwise is something that I, I can't get the pulse on so easily anymore. Uh, we talk about it in staff meetings and then we try to I try to make some inferences and figure out some resources and go from there uh, so that you all can feel as prepared as possible to do the task of a mediator. Um, so today, uh, we thought we would vi revisit the technique. So nothing, uh, if you've been to the training at our DRC, you, you know these techniques. They're in your manual. And today, I wanted to just take a little time and review most of them. I may have left some off, um, off the list. Um, I am using a PowerPoint presentation that I've used for non-mediators and people outside the DRC. So I am recycling a bit. I am taking that shortcut. But what I think is important about this space is that we get a chance to visit um, these techniques and talk through them if they're working or not. Are things more complex and challenging in the mediation space? Um, are there only one or two techniques that you lean into? Um, 
maybe because it's Zoom or maybe because that's where your comfort zone is. Let's talk about that. Are there techniques that others are using and to get over an impasse or get beyond an impasse or over a hump or that they use to kind of defuse things? Um, and then I'm, I'm curious about if anything has changed in that mediation space with the clients, be it a civil dispute from small claims or the general civil docket, a family dispute. I think a couple of you may do family disputes as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, the disputes involved that involve family members, be it domestic relations or um, guardianship or special education. Um, let's hear it so that as I continue to look for training resources, we do have some funds this year and, and for the next several years, we can maybe identify trainers that we can bring to the center to help us learn um, more techniques um, and, and, you know, how to stretch this model to get the greatest benefit for uh, our clients. So that's kind of my angle today. I want it to be a conversation. I think all of you have heard me or most of you have heard me in a training, the 40 hour training. So I don't want to bore you in that way. I'm going to share my screen. And again, I'm going to uh, use a PowerPoint simply because uh, that'll help me stay on task. So everyone can see that screen. Yes. Uh, I'm going to skip through some of the slides simply because um, I want to. Yeah, I think that'd be a better thing. Uh, I want to um, kind of go through them. So for those who are fairly new to the center or who have not been around for a while, I just wanted to start with our mission statement. Uh, this is where all of our work begins. Is it we want to be mission driven and not mission drifting? Um, so our mission is to offer our, our services in a way that is affordable, constructive, restorative, and healing to help people uh, resolve their conflict, and we still work in Washington and Livingston counties. And the values that we firmly hold are respect, accessibility, restorative justice, diversity, and inclusion. And for those who may not know, we are a 501c3, and there's 15 other centers in the state of Michigan similar to ours. Um, so again, uh, we are a nonprofit, and, and our services look like mediation, restorative justice practices, and training. And we work with disputes from a variety of, of areas across the count, both counties, um, district and circuit court schools, and just the general community. Um, and these are the kinds of things that you see most often. We work with this definition of mediation as a process in which a neutral third party assists people in identifying the issues of mutual concern, developing options for resolving those issues and finding resolutions acceptable to all people. And with just that definition in mind, we are facilitative mediators. We're not uh, arbitrators. We're not fact finders. We're not investigators. And we don't give recommendations. So I think when I think about the techniques that we've identified in our training, or maybe you're beginning to identify out of necessity, I think we have to make sure that we're working within the parameters of what mediation is, and then I'm asking you to work within the parameters of our mission and values. We wear this hat as mediators where we're listening actively, we're framing issues and information, we're sensitive to the strongly felt values of the other people. Uh, we acknowledge those power differences and I'm hearing anecdotally that those power differentials are really uh, becoming more intense in mediations. Not only at our center, this is a statewide uh, phenomenon that we're, um, that the centers collectively discuss. We, um, we're earning trust in maintaining the acceptability uh, we turn, we help them turn their positions into help. needs and interest. Right. Um, we identify those issues that cannot be mediated. There are times that we get the case, the referral from the court. Most of our cases still come from the court. 
Um, and we know, looking at the case or after listening to the opening statements of the parties, that there are some things that you cannot mediate or issues that cannot be identified for the mediation. And then we help them create options, um, identifying their principles and criteria that might guide decision making and assess whether the agreement options can be implemented. So in one mediation or maybe a couple sessions of a mediation, a lot is happening. So we have this toolkit, and I'm just going to kind of go through the next set of slides, and then, uh, but jump in if you have um, a comment, a question, um, or you just want to add to the conversation. I, I have no problem with that. So one of the tools that the previous slides indicate is that we are to remain uh, neutral and impartial. So even when tempers are flaring, even when comments are being made that are um, unsavory, we're to remain neutral and impartial. Uh, we balance the power difference, differences by assisting the, the persons um, to obtain the information that they need. We know that information is a power thing. Some people withhold information to maintain their sense of power uh, and they don't share. Um, I imagine sometimes uh, some information is shared with the DRC staff um, and not with the other party. Like changes in behavior kind of like post. Maybe yesterday he's like, well, the car is I hear some someone else talking. Is that, can that be muted, please? Cars from Ohio. Yeah, Ohio. because they probably have doctor's offices from in Ohio. Yeah. Okay, I think I got it. Sorry, I got that. Um, and then we deal with emotions and consider whether the emotions are allowing understanding of feelings or the unbalancing of the mediation. So a lot of times people are very emotional and we got to figure out how does that emotion either disrupt the process or it adds value to the process because it's affirming or confirming that the problem is important, the, the impact of not resolving it is important. People can only express themselves emotionally and, they're, and they struggle to find words. Um, an, a few other things that we use in our toolkit um, is that we manage the agenda. Um, I, I, the last couple fall seasons, 2022 and 2023, I, we were actually did the 40 hour training and that was a big part of our discussion with the newer mediators. We must manage the agenda and consider changing the order of the items. We have to manage the agenda. So folks are giving us their two or three items that they want to discuss. We determine the order of discussion and we have the freedom to change that order if we need to. I know flip charts are difficult to do in Zoom, but using the whiteboard or plain sheet of paper, notepad or whatever to write down the issues, the options and agreements when you can. Uh, this is a tool that some of us have gotten away from simply because we're virtual and it's not so easy to navigate. So we might spend some time there. Um, but Zoom gives us the ability to use a whiteboard Zoom gives us an ability to have just a blank sheet of paper on the screen, and you can share the screen as I'm doing now, and you can type things in for people to see. We uh, still listen actively. We give um, empathic responses that mirror what was said, both in content and feeling. We're letting people know that we hear their anger. We, hear, we understand that they're sad. It appears that they may um, be confused by the information that they're hearing but we wanna let them know that that feeling, that emotion is a part of the discussion and it's also telling us something. Uh, this is actually the last slide on tools and I'll uh, put this out there and then maybe we can just open up the discussion of what's, work, what's workable, what's not, what's easy to navigate. So I, I think I stopped, uh, my internet went out when I talked about interest-based bargaining our interest-based uh, conflict management, uh, we lean into those principles. Um, so how do you separate the parties, take a deeper dive into what's really bugging them and help move them from their position and, and being so principled into what is their real interest? Did they hear everything that was said at the, in the mediation? 
or did they black it out because they're only concerned about the position that they have? Um, mediators are not fact finders. We know somewhere in there is the truth. But remember, perceptions of the conflict is what's real to the parties. What they perceive, their perception is their reality, even if the story for the other party or parties differs greatly. And I think sometimes we struggle with that just in our own humanity. That doesn't sound like the truth to me. It doesn't line up with what other people have said. Um, but we're not there to fact find and discover the truth. We're not interrogating them. And just generally, uh, and, and I know that this is true, just maintaining our good attitude and remaining non-judgmental. We have no uh, Sally, for those who work with Sally, uh, I miss Sally too. Um, we, she would say often we have no horse in this race. And I had, and that's a phrase that I adopted. And I think about when I am in the position to facilitate, I have no horse in this race. The parties have the right to leave this session and still have the problem that they came here with. Uh, so we have to be comfortable with that. Um, and also believe that people can resolve their disputes uh, on their own outside of that, it's just that empowerment. Uh, so we might have to spend some time um, with them on that. So I've said a lot over these last, uh, over a cluster of slides and I just wanna stop the share so I can see everybody. What is your gut reaction to that? Do you think about these techniques? Has it shifted from when we were doing things in person to now so much is happening on Zoom for you all? Do we need to go back to the research board and try to figure out other things to do um, because we're in Zoom? And I think to some degree, mediators across the state of Michigan, if not the country, are also thinking about this. How do we handle this in Zoom, especially for those of us who had years and years of experience doing things in person? So I'm gonna stop and see if any hands go up. Your hand right in the book. Let's see, make sure you do the prodigy today. I see someone from the Office of Community and Economic Development. Amy, somebody? Uh, I'm I'm willing to chime in. Oh. So sorry. <laughs> okay. Can you mute yourself so we can hear Thomas? Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to add. I I think the idea of the agenda and really sticking to that is crucial, especially in Zoom. And you get these breakout rooms where it, they're almost like in totally different environments. Um, and echoing learning the whiteboard, I. Uh, I've been in mediations where, where we have mediators that are really, really comfortable with Zoom, and it adds a lot to the process. So I think just immersing yourself and diving in and willing to embrace it is, is a huge benefit uh, to the mediation. So I don't know. That, that's my only thought. But No, I appreciate that. Thank you. The agenda and using the whiteboard. Any other comments? Alexandria, hey. And then Greta, I think. Yep. I have to say that I really miss the face-to-face -face of us gathering, but I don't miss the face-to-face -face of the uh, mediations. And the reason is that people seem to be a lot more courteous, or maybe they just realize that uh, going off their cork is not going to get them anywhere at all except for us to mute them and, and, and close, out the, close out the mediation. So I, I have found that it is easier to talk with both parties and they have been, uh, as far as I can tell, fairly polite with each other. They, good, they, they allow good. each other to talk. They allow each other to uh, voice their opinions, even if it's a little bit in an angry voice, the other person is not cutting in. So I've had some good experiences with the Zoom uh, platform. And um, I think overall, it probably works better than face to face. Uh, another reason is, too, that people don't have to leave their home to go somewhere and be there. And they come in maybe with the attitude, uh, what a waste of time, because the other person is not going to give in an inch. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they already walk in with an attitude. So with the Zoom, it seems like they're already in a space where they feel rather comfortable 
because nobody's going to reach out and be really nasty. You, you can't touch the person. You, you're not looking in there right at them. So uh, I have found the Zoom to be a good platform. One of the things I'm curious about, uh, Belinda, are the stats for the state for the year, for the year mm -hmm. 2023, if ever you get around to looking at them or have your office people look at them. How are we doing? Uh, not mm -hmm. just us, but I mean statewide. How is this process doing in resolving what the court wants resolved? Are mm -hmm. we at a good place is, I guess, is my question. Yeah. So I'll answer that question so I won't forget to answer that question. Statistically, I just shared with the board last Thursday that our center numbers are getting back to those levels of pre-pandemic. So we've seen a, we're doing more than 600. We're accepting more than 600 cases each year for 2022 and 2023. We accepted more than 600 cases. Wow. That said, the Zoom process, uh, the scheduling process itself, all cases are scheduled. Um, and if you remember, small claims was never scheduled. You show up at court and we can open and dispose a good number of cases in four hours. Mm -hmm. Well, that has stretched to be about two to three weeks just based on the case activity. So the disposition of the cases has slowed down considerably. But because most centers are doing, or all the centers are doing so much Zoom work, it doesn't affect us in a negative way. The state has accepted that the disposition will be slower simply because of the scheduling. <clears throat> we are in the midst of a time study across the state. So we're looking at some actual times. We get the case, how long does it take to do intake? How long does it take in mediation? How long it takes to this and that? And then we're submitting that data to the state um, in March, and they will look at it across the state to see, um, okay. not to weigh the health of what we're doing, but just to get the new realities of how long it takes to process a case from open to closing. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But they gave us our funding so, for the year, so I guess we're doing okay. I'll take that as a <laughs> good sign. <laughs> Belinda, one of the things that uh, and you asked if there were other things that come into play. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's even more basic than the, the, where you started. One of the things I miss from in-person mediation is the setting of the physical uh, arrangement, uh, the relationship between the parties, the, uh, the ability to make people comfortable with each other, if and even if there's uh, some hesitation to be comfortable uh, because they are adversaries at some point. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't, we don't, it's, it's a much more rigid relationship we have in the, in the Zoom environment. You don't give, you don't have the opportunity to get people to unwind, to relax, get comfortable, take off their coat, realize that they need a break, the bathroom's just down the hall. Uh, and, and quite frankly, one of the challenges, uh, it's a little more complicated when you want to caucus. Uh, I've had a number of occasions where uh, the other party didn't realize the caucus uh, resulted in a conversation, even though we explained it, that the other party is not there. Well, <laughs> in the courtroom setting, uh, they're out in the hallway. They know that. And it's so mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a much clearer uh, picture. Uh, I have always used, uh, because of my vintage, uh, the advantage of telling them experiences I've had over a period of years and tell them that this is a great opportunity that they have. And and. Uh, they met, they met their adversary perhaps once before or never before, and now they're actually seeing them in person and know that they're a real person, mm -hmm. as opposed to the stereotype of just a, a little one inch square on a, a zooming screen. Thanks, Al. I'm going to go back to Greta, and I saw Juliet's hand go up as well, and, and then I'll come back to you, Al, on, on your comments. Go ahead, Greta. Yeah. I'll underscore what Alexandria said and counter what Al said. I think it is easier on Zoom to have caucuses because mm. you don't have to, uh, people don't have to get their stuff together and then go down the hall and then you come back. So it is easier to get them in and out, get a sense of what they're really about when they're in a relaxed setting and nobody else is listening to them. And I think that's a big benefit at least as I've seen it, a big benefit of, of Zoom. So easier to maneuver into the caucus yes. space, is that what you're saying? 
absolutely. And it sounds to me, Al, that you said caucusing um, is challenging because people don't understand that piece of the process, even though it's been explained. Yeah. That's that's helpful. Maybe there's something we can do on the front end of appearing people. Juliet. Well, hello to the people who know me and also to those who don't. Um, I'm commenting even though I've pretty much been away from the mediation process for three to four years because of ongoing crises in my private life, which I'm happy to say seem to be resolving. But I wanted to chime in in support of what Alexandria and uh, Greta said. Um, sorry, Al. Because in the time that I was mediating, um, and I started with the DRC, I started long before the DRC, but I started with the DRC in 2013. So from then until about 2021 when I had to leave, um, I had lots of experience in different um, different courtrooms, different rooms off courtrooms in different buildings, and then also in the early days of mediating with um, Zoom. And I was so much impressed with how much better it worked with Zoom for reasons that took some thought. But I believe that the factors were, as Alexandria mentioned, first of all, people didn't have to leave where they were and travel, you know, some distance to arrive at some point and wait. Many of the people filing small claims or being at the other end of things, they get paid. They don't get paid if they're not at work. And so even if they have to sit out in a trunk truck on their lunch hour, it is so much better for them, and the weight is off of them to have to worry about whether what it's going to take for them to appear. And I had the impression at that time, I think it was confirmed by the statistics, but actually we had greater participation, as in there were fewer people who just were no-shows. Um, that may have changed, I don't know, but that was my impression at the time in the course of the first year that we did Zoom. A second factor was that... <sighs> I don't know if I want to say it's a more even playing field, but just people being able to occupy their own space gives them a sense of safety. And so if there were concerns about, you know, talking to their adversary face to face, there was just enough distance so that they didn't feel like uh, the boundaries were being stepped over, whatever their personal boundaries might be, um, that they weren't getting stepped over. And I recognize that as mediators, we were entrusted with the responsibility of ensuring the agenda, the proper order, and the comportment. Uh, but you can't, you can't deal with the unknowns. And a lot of people are very fragile in these situations. And I will say, speaking for myself, I found accommodations at certain of those locations really subpar in terms of trying to make people comfortable. And so. I know that Al felt that his introduction would put people at ease. I didn't see that too often myself. I mean, we all tried to do it, so let's assume that it was effective. But when you're sitting in a room where there's a, a restroom, and it may be the only restroom that's accessible for a while, that's not comfortable. When there is no um, drinking pitcher or opportunity for people to get a drink of water and they have to go out in the hall, that's not comfortable. When the furniture looks like it should have been returned to the manufacturer and exchanged 10 years ago or sold at auction or whatever, that's not comfortable. And people made their peace with it, but I didn't feel that it was, I mean, this is small stuff, but I still felt that it contributed to the sense of I'm in an alien environment and the sooner I get out of here, the better. Now, maybe that helps with resolving things because that way people aren't, you know, leaning back in their easy chairs and thinking that they've got four hours to wait things out. But I just overall felt that it worked so much better on Zoom. And I'll stop now. Thank you, Juliet. Juliet. Any other comments or? I, I, I want to be reactive. I can. I surrendered both to Juliet and, and Greta. I, I agree. One of the differences when we had mediation uh, on site, uh, many times, almost always, the parties arrived not knowing that mediation was really what they were there for. Mm -hmm. They had a notice to come to court. They filed a suit. And much to their surprise, they're not going to trial. They're being confronted with a mediation opportunity or requirement, or at least to try. So that's one of the differences. But it, it, when they did come to court and you did have 
questions that they have or they felt felt uh, uncertain as to what was what was about to happen. Uh, you had an opportunity to personify the relationship and explain that it was an informal environment and they were not there were no hazards there. And perhaps a lot of that is being done by Gail and Stephanie now as they prepare uh, clients or customers for mediation. And, and they and it, if they do do it, they do a good job. But uh, I still I think maybe as selfishly I enjoy the personal relationship that the on-site opportunities gave me to get to know the people a little bit better, get to know their body English, get to know their uh, the eye movements, the things that are very personal in their relationship as they react to what the other party is saying. So, I, but I surrendered to Juliet. Yes, that some of the furniture we sat on did leave a lot to be desired, and. And quite frankly, some of the new courthouses improve that situation. I know meeting in the sheriff's meeting room or, or break room in, over at Ypsilanti uh, meant you had to get permission to unlock the door. And if it was locked out, then you had to run to find somebody to let you back in. Those were those are the kind of memories I have there that are humorous. But I do have some good memories of having people relax when they realize that the mediator is a real person and that they and that mediator it, it can be sensitive and and in fact, have a lot in common with them. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al. Any other comments or questions from anyone? So it sounds like Zoom is not as horrible as I often think it is. I spend a lot of time on Zoom. And I'm glad to hear that, um, that it, and we did. We worked really hard, not only with our volunteer mediators, if you can think for those who were around June of May and June of 2020, beginning around May or June of 2020, when we got word that the case referrals would start coming in, again, as the courts were sort of warming up to their new platform, we were, um, we took, we dived right in and got the Zoom accounts and then we start helping volunteers prepare to be on Zoom. I think we you know, I don't want to say we were training people because we're not Zoom experts, but we're certainly giving you an overview of what that feels like and how to maneuver Zoom. We actually did that for the first year and a half, maybe two years, and it still may be happening from time to time. Many of our clients needed a quick tutorial on for Zoom. So uh, the staff in the background spent a lot of time there. And... Um, and then the Supreme Court, uh, the state Supreme Court said that Zoom would be a default or virtual platforms. I think Zoom itself would be a default. So when that word came out, we knew we were stuck with Zoom. Um, so we had to, you know, make sure all staff have their own accounts and, and you know, just change things in our budget and, and how we operate and operationalize our work. Uh, so Zoom will be here. I think as we've moving far further away from COVID, we want to give people, we do give some cases the option to meet in person. Maybe not the small claims, maybe for reasons that Juliet articulated, folks can step out of the job or, you know, take a break or whatever and address their small claims. But there's some other kinds of cases that being in person seems to be better for them, uh, for everyone involved. So we do make that offering when it feels appropriate or if a client requested. And we don't get many requests, but occasionally we get that request for an in-person service. Um, and it makes sense because some of the court cases are having hearings in person. So what the, you know, the experience that the clients have with the court, they want a similar experience with us. So we're able to navigate that to some degree. Um, I'm wondering if there's any thoughts about any of the techniques or what's happening, you know, physically things have changed. We don't have the body language. And I think that's a good point, Al. We not we can't read the body language the way that we once did. And that's what we learned in our training. Communication is the nonverbal stuff as well. Um, maybe we see more on the screen of facial expressions and you can zoom, you know, tap into that to see what that really means. Um, are there any other things that's happening in the cases that we should be discussing now or thinking about more training uh, so that you can feel as equipped as possible? Nothing? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Cheryl. 
My hand was up, but I don't know if you can Oh, I'm see sorry. It. I didn't see. No, it's your hand. And then I saw the, the lemons. I'm sorry. I missed your yeah. hand. <laughs> um, I've only observed two mediations, and uh, there was no whiteboard or shared screen. So I'm just wondering what other people have been doing. Um, you know, there was when the agreement was reached in the first mediation, that was, of course, done, written up on the screen for everybody to see. But in terms of notes or prioritizing, um, you know, what people wanted to discuss, what their issues were and their options were, not, none of that happened. So just I'd like to throw it out there to find out what people are doing generally. So does everyone know the function of the whiteboard and sharing your screen? Everyone is comfortable with that, or at least to some degree? Okay. I don't know how to use the whiteboard on the screen, but I do know how to bring up a document and write on it and share it that okay. way. All right. Um, so if you hit your share screen function on your Zoom, you can select whiteboard, and I'm just going to do it to demonstrate it, and then share that. And what comes up is this actual tool this whiteboard. And then there's some functions that you do to pick what you want to do to type. I'm not as familiar with it. I often will do just a blank sheet of paper, a, word, a blank Word document, because I'm so comfortable with that and I can just type on that. But that's the idea of the whiteboard. Um, if you're typing text, you can make a text box. Uh, here, you can make drawings and shapes. There are lots of functions. So if this is something that you might want to consider, I would suggest you practice with it because the functions are different from typing a document, a Word document. Um, and it can get tricky and it might, you know, create some confusion. Um, but to Cheryl's question, anyone talk using the whiteboard ever or not or comfortable with it? Phyllis, your hand went up. I did see your hand. <laughs> uh um, yes, Cheryl's, Cheryl's hand was part of this beautiful fruit and vegetables behind her. Um, I, I do miss the whiteboard and I'm so glad that this is the topic today, uh, part of the conversation because I really like using that when we met in person. Uh -oh. So, oh, Phyllis, said, did we lose Phyllis, Phyllis a little breaking, bit? You're breaking up a bit, Phyllis. Um, if you want to turn off your video, that right. might help you with your audio. Okay, let's see if that works. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was very helpful to the participants. Whether Did we lose her? No. This is a problem like Zoom. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, Phyllis, we can hear you now. So you, so you may have to start over. <clears throat> so I'm, basically, I'm looking forward to the whiteboard as a way to help the participants focus on what the issues are, what they might have said or not said, and I think it helps to clarify. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm for trying it. Okay, sounds good. So um, we can talk about that within the DRC or the coordinators can talk about that. I don't know. And Gail, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. I don't know if that means that you're hosting the Zoom. Do you co-host with the um, volunteers and they share the screen or do you do that typing for them or something like that? But we have to think of the mechanics of that so that the volunteer can uh, mm -hmm. use that technique because that is a, you know, a documented technique around helping parties stay focused. Mm -hmm confirming with the parties that you've heard them, you've heard their issue. That's another reason why we would write it down on the flip chart. Um, we would write it down so that the other party 
can also stay focused. The, the, the non-speaking party can stay focused um, and, and not necessarily, um, you know, start preparing their rebuttal. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, mechanically, how does that work um, in a Zoom session? Yeah, I think um, in any of the, the cases that I coordinate, if somebody wants to try it, um, I can either be prepared uh, I tend to think kind of like with what Belinda said, just using a blank word document would be easier for me rather than the whiteboard, just because I'm easy, I'm comfortable typing. Um, but if I could either be in the background and type what you tell me to type, or you you know I can make you a co-host and or you can bring up your own document and try it yourself. I tend mm -hmm. to think generally in small claims. Um, you know, I always think of small claims kind of speed dating of mediations, you know, where you're, the issues are, are usually pretty limited. Um, and most of the time, you know, there, you know, there might be some other strange, you know, things coming in, but they seem pretty focused in, in small claims. I don't know, Phyllis, if you were referring to when it was six, helpful if that was in a small claim setting or if that was in a general civil or a circle setting. But I, um, I think it was helpful. Okay. Yep. Well um, we can it was helpful. I'm gonna I'll go away. Um it it, it it's a it, I felt a useful way of breaking apart the elements of, of the issues. And sometimes it a, was a way of getting at a, um, a possible uh, solution that, that wasn't expressed in the first place. Um, for instance, if if there was a, you know, whatever the amount was, very often it's a combination of several different items. And if they can be separated out, they can be taken individually and maybe, oh, well, okay, I, I, I'm i not going to count that as mm -hmm. part of what I want, um, so forth. Uh, uh, Lavana's had her hand up, I know. Yeah. Thank you, Phyllis. Go ahead, Lavana. And you're muted. I, I, I have an easel, an easel with a flip chart. And I don't know, for me, um, I don't type as fast as I write. And I don't know if that is something that I can try to use, you know, mm -hmm. turning the computer toward, just like in teaching, turning the computer to the flip chart um, and writing it. And maybe, I don't know, if Gail, you would want to put it in the whiteboard. I mean, I'm just kind of thinking out loud because uh, absolutely visual is far more powerful mm -hmm. and people are seeing what was said, you know, we're summarizing and what was said and, and it, it is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's an interesting idea and I'm not opposed to it. Uh, I just want to give a couple caveats to that. So if you as an individual um, have the easel and the flip chart, you have to be able to you know, use a dark marker so people can see it on the screen. Um, large print so that people can read it. Confidentiality is still there, so we wouldn't want those flip chart notes to be floating around the house or other people to be you know, using, you know, seeing it. So that would have to be shredded at the end of the session, just like your you know, your personal handwritten notes that you might be taking on your notepad at home. Um, so we still have to adhere to those uh, behaviors to preserve the confidentiality. Um, I have never tried that, to be honest, and, and I just think it's an interesting thing maybe to uh, experiment with to see that if you had that up and there, you know, six boxes or four boxes on the screen, can everyone see it well? 
um, you know, why not try it and see where it takes us? Um, I, I like the flip chart. I just have a personal affinity for that. And for those who were in my training, you saw me using it and referring to it a lot. Um, I just really, really like it because for all of the reasons that we talk about, I, I'm a person that likes multiple color markers and I make a whole thing out of it and maybe go too far. Um, but in this case, if you're on Zoom, probably the heavier colors, dark, the, the black, the blue is a good, heavy, strong color. Red is a strong color as well. If we get into colors that are not as strong, it may be hard to see visually for the people who are on this, on Zoom. But, but it would be interesting to try and, and give us some feedback, Levana, and see how it works. Um, so I'm hearing the use of the whiteboard in the or a blank document, I wanted to come back to caucusing. We know that that is a, a, a strong technique that we use um, in mediation for a variety of reasons. Uh, parties, their tempers are escalating. We might need to separate them to explore why are the emotions escalating. We, we caucus when maybe information is a bit confusing. Maybe we're confused as a mediator and we need to get some clarity from the party um, on what their issues are or concerns or positions are. So caucusing can be that. Caucusing is good to explore proposals. Maybe people are just being abstinent and they won't. Uh, bye, Lavana. Good to see you. Uh, um, and they won't. Um, they're not negotiating and engaging in the negotiation well. We can caucus for that. Um, and, and a host of other reasons. Caucuses make sense. Some mediators, I don't know if it happens at the DRC, but some mediators caucus early in the session to get the statements from parties, especially if attorneys are um, involved in the mediation. And some mediators only caucus when there's an absolute need. And we know that, you know, one of the rules about caucusing is caucus with one party, you got to caucus with all parties. So you got to be prepared and have a reason to caucus. Um, I've heard a couple things that caucusing can be a little bit wonky when the parties don't understand or are not clear on why caucusing is happening. And I've also heard that caucus in Zoom space is easy to maneuver because you're literally putting people in a breakout room. You can do that manually. Either, uh, you know, Gail or Stephanie or whoever is hosting your mediation can do that. And if the mediator is the co-host, you can do that and have some control over, you know, just manually put people in the breakout room. I see those as two different things. My question is, what more can we say to the participants to prepare them for caucusing? Should we, are we, do we feel that they're just, should we have some definition of caucus? So when you Al say, we're gonna move to caucus, should the the chat be a caucus is, <laughs> and, and I'm saying that because as a staff, I would have, you know, have that written or typed somewhere and I can cut and paste that right into the chat. So the parties can say, read that chat for one minute and say, oh, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's going to do. He's going to meet with us one at a time in the breakout room, or I'm going to go into the waiting room or however you guys maneuver that. Is that something that will be helpful? And Greta, I saw your hand go up. Um, I think caucus is something that means something to us. I don't see it as important for our clients to know. And so referring to it as a private confidential conversation that we're going to have with each of them, um, I think works works better. It's a little bit less daunting than having to learn what a caucus is and explaining a caucus. But they everybody has had private confidential conversations. So it just seems much more accessible to me. Okay. And if we, and if you're explaining it that way or framing it that way, would it be helpful for that to be in the chat for the parties? Sure. Just to reinforce it, and I, and I don't want to give the, you know, the theoretical view uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, definition to make it technical and academic, but just something to, so if I'm the party in the waiting room or waiting for my caucus, oh yeah, they're just going to, they, I will get a turn. You know, something like that might come to mind. Certainly. Yeah, Gail, did you want to jump in? Um, 
I would say I, with using the chat with the parties, we have, a, you know, most of them, I don't even think they're aware of it, you know, aware of the chat, aware of the chat. Yeah. And, you know, even to get a lot of the, the parties that participate in the mediations that I coordinate to be able to understand, you know, they have enough trouble finding the, the mute and the stop video button. <laughs> so I probably, I, um, I think that could be a little bit clunky for, for a lot of the, a lot of the folks mm -hmm. that aren't that familiar with Zoom. Or, you know, a lot of them are also um, participating on their phone. And I think it's oh. even harder to see it, see the chat mm -hmm. on your phone too. It is. You have to know Just, how to yeah. go to more. I mean, I'm, I have an Android, yeah. so I have to go to more, yeah. pick chat. Then it takes me to a different screen. It looks different. Yeah. Then I got to find <laughs> the, the, uh, the screen again with all the faces on it. So, yeah, it can be a little bit clunky. One thing know. that I about caucuses that um, that I've noticed that uh, that's happened in a couple of mediations is when mediators have said, um, you know, they've introduced the idea of the private meeting and and they've said they've sort of asked permission to say, what do you all think about? going to a, a private conversation, having a private conversation right now. And usually, you know, the parties don't say anything, but a, twice I heard it happen where the party was like, no, I want to, I want to stay and continue talking, which, um, and for this one particular mediation, you know, it's sort of like, if you ask, be prepared that they could say no, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it's kind of, flies in the face a little bit of what you were saying earlier about the media, the mediators of one that are controlling the conversation mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot of time as mediators, when we feel like, oh, I need to talk to these people alone. We know we need to talk to them. You know, there's mm -hmm. a reason that we need to, and that asking for permission can, can backfire on you a little bit. Just, just a thought, just something to share that I've seen happen in a couple of mediations. But I appreciate you sharing that. The mediator has to control the process. You have to control the process. I saw, uh, Cheryl, was it your hand that was up? Yeah, I, I didn't do my training um, at the DRC. I did it with um, Zena through somewhere else, I forget. And part of the, I don't know if the materials are exactly the same, but the statement about going into caucus or having a private conversation was part of the opening statement. And is that in your materials as well? When the mediator makes kind of the opening statement, they say, you know, about being neutral, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the whole yeah. thing. You say there may, at some time during this, we may decide that it's beneficial to speak with each of you separately, and we call that a caucus. It's private and confidential. You each get a chance. So um, I kind of agree about putting it in the chat. I think it's not a good idea to put it in the chat just because we don't know what level technical knowledge people have. So mm -hmm. I think just explaining it verbally um, mm -hmm. better. But is it in the materials from the DRC? Is, is yes. the manual the same? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, um, Zena's material is to a great extent a mirror of our material. So, um, so yes, it is there. And I think just as general rule, so we're a community dispute resolution program, and that means anybody in the community can access our our services. And we see um, many of the community members are folks who cannot afford the services of of private practitioners. <laughs> So with that said, we, we've we learned that we have to repeat a lot of stuff. We, we may have to say it in an opening statement, then we have to say it you know, later on in the process, and that's pretty normal for us. So um, yeah, so how we frame that I think um, is important. And, and I'm not advocating for putting it in the chat. Um, it's, you know, I, I leave that up to the mediators because you're controlling the process of what makes sense for your participants at that time. Um, but we do have to restate, reiterate, and underscore some of the basic things that we've said in our opening statement about the process. 
And some and there are times when the staff have, has done intake and they've had to say that as well. For some of our cases, like the cases I work with, uh, a person may say, what if I need to speak to the mediator separately? Can I do that? Then I talk about the caucus. Yeah. Yeah, there's an opportunity to do that. So uh, any other comments? This might be a shorter lunch and learn, Gail. <clears throat> Just uh, want to say, well, the discussion has been uh, thus far uh, the, the uh, formal differences between the Zooming and the meeting in personal. Uh, personally, for myself, what I miss most about the on-site meetings is a relationship with my fellow mediators, uh, which is... Um, deteriorates when it's only left with the formal one-on-one -on -one that you have with the session that you're uh, having at that point. Oftentimes when we had group meetings of mediators, half a dozen or more mediators meeting at the same time, you did have an interaction with those people and you uh, got to know them as something beyond just a formal co-mediator. And I miss that uh, immeasurably. Uh, we've lost some of those mediators during these last years. Mm -hmm. And uh, and hopefully someday we'll have an occasion other than the special parties that, that we put together <laughs> and we uh, break down the barriers with a little bit of alcohol. Other than that, we don't have many opportunities <laughs> to meet each other. And quite frankly, the post-session uh, uh, caucuses that we have where we uh, evaluate the experiences uh, are much more limited than when we were actually sitting and relaxing in an environment in a chair that it was in another, in a different setting. I miss it. I appreciate that, Al. Um, I think we all miss that kind of connection and making that kind of connecting, uh, having those moments where we can connect. Um, we do try to throw a little soiree for the volunteers at least one time a year where folks can get out and have some eat and drink on the DRC as a token of our appreciation. And we are planning that again this year. Um, I think, um, as I said, more than 90% of our cases are referred by the court, ordered or referred. So that means that these people have gone to court or they've gotten a statement from the court that talks about Zoom. Small claims, they don't have a hearing first, but they are told about Zoom. Um, and I think it has become a norm in our in our. Um, in our society, um, and we, you know, in, in the DRCs of the state are just conceding to that. I think all of us would prefer in-person services, those in-person connections, but it was just a, a, a battle that we could not win, um, mm -hmm. especially when our state Supreme Court said this is the, the default. And many judges prefer online services. And in fact, I'm hearing that some judges look at their clicks on their YouTube channels uh, they like to look at their clicks, uh, their likes, I'm sorry, the likes on their YouTube channel. So people have gotten really accustomed to this virtual space um, and and they want to stick with it. And I don't think we'll go back. Uh, with that said, if the staff hears that the parties would prefer to be in person or there's something unique about the case that an in-person session makes more sense for them, they have the ability to schedule it in person and they will, um, you know, that is, they have their, it's their decision to do that if they want to do that. So that's where we are. Well, if I have a, something for, that you could maybe talk about. Sometimes okay. um, mediators talk about in the debriefer at the end, you know, the fine line between how we do not make suggestions but kind of the what's your perspective on the idea of floating ideas or things for them to consider, you know, where you wanted to start getting them thinking outside of the box and doing that without, you know, giving them, you know, a number or anything, but just that nudging, nudging people along. So, again, we're neutral. We're not telling people what to do. Um, we're guiding them through a process where they can reach their own conclusions. But there are times to break the ice, to get beyond impasse. A mediator may give an out of 
you know, out of the box kind of suggestion. Um, my very first mediation, I remember this, I was still a student, I was doing my internship, but I was mediating um, with a very seasoned mediator and he's, and there was a neighbor dispute and his out of the box suggestion was, so which one of you is planning to move? And we had heard their opening statements. We knew that they both were homeowners. We knew that they raised their families uh, and, and had no desire to move. They were fighting over a property line, fence and shrubs, things like that. Um, and he he very calmly and politely made that suggestion, which got a knee jerk reaction from the parties. And then they started thinking about other ideas. So it was just to unlock that. And that's okay. That was, you know, what I learned, that it's okay to do that. But if we're telling them that you need to take the proposal, I heard you say you ha actually have $5,000 of extra income. Why don't you pay this in full and not do a payment plan? If we're doing things like that, then we're, we have greatly overstepped um, the boundary of that. We So a uh, a suggestion that's kind that's outside the box might get them to move a little bit um, is acceptable. If there are multiple, if there are proposals on the table and the other party is just not conceding, you might want to use caucus to talk about what's the concern with these proposals. The proposal A says, you know, you're not. Uh, what's the concern about that? Proposal B, proposal C just to get them to explore more with you privately on on what's wrong with the proposals and what could be their counter proposal. Uh, oftentimes people think the proposal is the final answer. They are not empowered enough to know that, they're, that they can even counter what's been proposed. So the caucus can give you space to do that without shaming them um, no embarrassment or blaming them for halting the mediation process. Uh, so that can happen there. Sometimes the <clears throat> one of the parties may even query the mediator to say, "Well, what do you think? You know, have you got any ideas?" Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, uh, you have to handle that with uh, respect for it. Uh, but I, I I think possibly you, your response can be, "Well, look, if mediation is an opportunity for you to resolve this, and in order for us to resolve this." Both parties have to give a little bit, possibly. Possibly, you don't have to give anything at all, but think in terms of of compromise, uh, which perhaps they didn't think was a potential, either going to be a winner or a loser. And mediation, there's an opportunity to avoid that the uncertainty of that. Uh, I always, and I've said this before, so cut me off if, 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 if you remember. I've always met, made the note that while we're neutral, we I have not been neutered, meaning I do have an opinion. And while I'm not going to impose my opinion on you, I can share with you some of the ideas that my opinion may represent and without actually taking sides. So you can add some information that they may not be considering that have implications for them without actually having it represent your opinion as to who's right or wrong. Uh, if, but the mediator that sits there waiting for the parties to resolve it between themselves is oftentimes going to be disappointed because it takes help from the mediator in most instances, to come to a resolution of the difference. So, Al, if I'm hearing you correctly, you are asking the permit the parties for permission to introduce a couple ideas that they might want to consider. Yes, I, I can live with that. I can live with that as long as you're not saying you need to do this or this is the mm -hmm. best way to do it or you should. You know, I've been listening to you, and a couple ideas came to mind. Do you mind if I share them with you? Something, I, those are Belinda's words. You know, you might say I, it a little differently. I like the folksiness of you don't have a horse in that race. Mine's a little cruder. I always say I don't have a dog in the hunt. <laughs> <laughs> Phyllis, your hand went up. So just following up on what the last couple of comments, um, I, I think I've said sometimes, sometimes um, I've heard people say, uh, solve it in this way, and it's not, mm -hmm. uh, it's not coming from me. It's somebody else's <laughs> idea. Um, 
So I don't know. If it, it feels comfortable to me, but. Um, uh, if the mediator is saying solve it in this way, you've probably told them to solve it in this way. We're telling them what to do. Yeah, solve it like this. Um, I think the default, um, I shouldn't say I think, when we train folks, we say frame it as a question, then you're not telling people what to do. Uh, so frame it as, there are several proposals here. Would you like to consider proposal A only? Or would you like to give more consideration to this idea? Um, what's the concern about this idea? What's the barrier to moving this one forward? Um, if it's about money, and this is, these civil cases are usually about transacting money, is this dollar amount more than can be paid? Are there concerns about this dollar amount? Would you like to consider a payment schedule? <clears throat> That's giving them more to think about than just I need to, you know, come up with three thousand mm -hmm. dollars right now. You know, that can be daunting. That might shut people down. But if we can expand that in a way that they can, you know, start chewing on that, then that that could be helpful. But I think framing it as a question keeps us in that neutral space. It keeps us on that side of the line of not telling people what to do. The liability around this and the ethical concerns is that even if you don't intend for it to be a direction to take pro that proposal, that's what people hear, then they do it, it doesn't work out, then who's liable? When they come back to the center, will they say, my mediator told me I should do this and it didn't work or it cost me you know, this injury or whatever, then what do I do? You know, what do I do now? Volunteers, you're protected in the state of Michigan. Volunteers are protected unless you do something really egregious. Um, but you're protected for lawsuits. The suit will come to the DRC. Or it will be against the DRC, I should say. Juliet. So I just wanted to comment that for many years I worked for a judge in Washtenaw County, Judge Nancy Wheeler, and I did a lot of settlement conferences and essentially I functioned as a mediator for much of what I did in part because that was what she wanted and it was a good way to do things. But there was a big difference in the way that I governed, so to speak, those conferences or those mediations and the way that the DRC works because um, I forgot what the word is for it, uh, facilitative versus I forgot the other word. Um, but I was in a position where I knew what she was likely to do if they didn't come to a resolution, and I could tell them that. And it would save them a lot of heartache if they didn't imagine that each one of them was going to get sole custody or anything like that, because I could just tell them that's not going to happen. But there's a whole different approach you have to take as a facilitative uh, mediator, and we all know that. And I think, especially for those of us who have been lawyers, sometimes it's hard to step back from knowing everything. And I like what you say about couching things in terms of questions, because people actually do want to hear what your ideas are. They'll ask you though. <laughs> and then I think answering in the form of a question makes sense because what you're, you're doing, you're throwing back to them the question that they're asking you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've seen it happen where somebody thinking that he wasn't leaning on somebody or she leaned on somebody and maybe they came to that conclusion anyway, but I think they also got the message this was the right way to do it. And it wasn't an empowering experience. So I just wanted to to highlight the the appreciation I think that we have for letting people make their decisions. Mm -hmm. We're not robots. We're not neutered. You're right, Al. But overstepping that line is such an easy thing to do, especially when you think you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julia. I appreciate that. And when you were the judicial attorney for the judge, you had a you had a position of power too. 
Absolutely. that we don't have at the Absolutely. DRC. We, you know, we we really diffuse those perceptions about power as well. Um, that's how we balance the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other comments or thoughts? We haven't had a, <clears throat> we haven't had any comments thus far Thank you. about the uh, ideas of the co-mediation and how it, whether it works any differently in, on the Zoom environment as opposed to in, in, a, in a personal setting. Uh, I know that the facilitators, Gail and, and Stephanie, work real hard to get good co-mediated combinations and uh, the challenges of doing that. But is there any comments about how it's working for co-mediation and Zooming as opposed to on-site? Mm -hmm. Gail, did you? Uh, yeah, I'll leave that to Gail. So the question is, do they work? Does it? Is it easier to uh, co-mediate on Zoom versus live and in person? And I mean, my experience and my observation is, I think it is a little, a little bit more difficult for co-mediators to you know, be able to really get in sync with each other sometimes and, and read each other when you're um, on Zoom. I do think most um, mediators know that they can always caucus, you know, that they can talk to each other. And I've seen many, many of you all do that, you know, like before you talk to the parties, you say, hey, let's talk to each other first. Um, but uh, I think I think you all, because so many of you know each other, um, I try to, when I pair people that have never mediated with each other before, um, ask folks to describe how what they think their mediation style is and what they think their strengths or weaknesses are and, and that sort of thing, just so that they can kind of get to know each other. Um, so I think there are a few more challenges you know, working, getting really in sync with your co-mediator at first. But I think over time, as you do multiple mediations with folks, those those tend to go away. And um, people, co-mediators co come into the mediation kind of, you know, knowing who they're going to be dealing with and, and how you all can work best together. That's kind of my, my observation. I don't know if... Um, folks out there have a, have a different perspective of, of your experience with your co-mediators on Zoom. No response. No um, response. So I'm going to um, stop here and just thank you all for your attention and your comments and contribution um, to what this experience really is like. Um, I will say that we are looking, and, and Gail and I, before we started today's session, we, we quickly chatted about maybe an opportunity to have a, a different trainer facilitator to come in and, and give us some insight around de-escalation if that is something that you're experiencing at the mediation table. And maybe we're unique because I think it was, um, I think Alexandria said that people behave well and they're cordial and are courteous to each other and they're behaving well. I'm hearing some stories from other centers <laughs> that that is not the case. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm making some inferences based on what uh, folks at other centers are experiencing. But we do have some funds that we can invest into some, you know, bringing a trainer in and giving us more tools or just some, you know, just some more insight, if you wish, um, if that's something that will be beneficial to you. So I would say give feedback to me, any of the DRC staff, uh, so that we can do the work to do the uh, outreach to them. If there's a different kind of training message that you want to hear, because you experience this someplace else, just let at least let us know about it and we can explore it. And if it fits into our budget, we definitely are happy to do that uh, for you all. Andy, did you want to? Yeah. Yeah, Belinda, you, you've got access to the stats around the state. I wonder how we stack up against the other centers in getting cases settled. 
Um, we're doing pretty good. Thank you for asking that. I do monitor our settlement rate, and it's around still hovering around 70%. It dipped down to 68, then it was at 71. So somewhere within, I think, a, a acceptable deviance um, mm -hmm. that we are settling cases, and that's across the board. I have not isolated civil cases versus family cases or other cases. That's our settlement rate across the board. And quite frankly, that's been our settlement rate for a very long time. Um, since I've been director, I think I've been giving that kind of feedback to the board. How that measures to uh, with other centers, um, I'm going to say that we're, we're considered a well-performing center in that respect. Some of the other centers are uh, closer to 50% settlement rate. Um, or just a smidget below. And it's not shutting, you know, putting their center in jeopardy. It's begging the question of what's happening in the mediations in the last couple years, two or three years, as compared to uh, pre COVID. And what else should we be thinking about in this uh, community dispute resolution space? Uh, so, some of the comments I've made today is because I've had those conversations with other center directors. I'm not worried about our settlement rate. Of course, I want it to stay above 70%, 70 or 70% 70 or above as much as I can. But I realize that, you know, aged cases may have played a part in that. The older the case, the more entrenched mm -hmm. people may be. And it's hard for them to think about conceding. They're angry because their filing have, has been sitting in the courthouse in a box and not processed for a couple of years. Um, and then when they get that call from the court, they're being sent to mediation. <laughs> so some of that might play out in your in the mediations itself. I think we <clears throat> might be beyond um, a lot of the age civil cases. In Washington County, um, Judge Connors has been doing trials of those age cases, which has made pe a lot of people happy because they have been sitting around for a couple of years and he just set them for trial. Um, he's doing trials. It feels like a few trials a week, and um, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. He does a lot of trials uh, to get through those general civil cases that have been sitting in Washington County Court. Um, so yeah, that's where we are, Andy. I think we're doing okay. I and our in my resolve, if any of you are on in my resolve, I looked at the data for that um, recently, and that's actually performing well when we have a mediation. Um, many of those cases close unable to contact, uh, and that's the virtual platform for those who uh, don't know. There's a virtual platform where the parties sign on to a chat space to address their dispute, and a, mediators, uh, a mediator can be assigned. Those numbers are going up, so if you're into that, let Stephanie know so she can get you prepared to be in that virtual space but we had more than 150 cases last year. Um, a lot of them are the collection cases that you saw in small claims like U of M Credit Union and you know the, those folks, they're using the virtual platform first because they come with a bundle of filings. They may file 15, 20 cases at a time mm -hmm. and do the virtual platform. So Stephanie is heavily involved with that, but I looked at a subset of those cases and there were settlements. Uh, for those cases, and it's all done virtually, and we're we're anticipating those numbers to go up. In 2023, we address more than 150 of those virtual cases, and I'm anticipating that they will that number will rise more. Uh, will continue to rise in 2024, but we'll see. Gotcha. Yeah. How about, how about closing? Telling us about your housing situation, your office, your expanded facilities, and that. where are we at, Belinda? <laughs> Uh, with the DRC, well, uh, funny you should ask, Al, because I'm going to go look at a rental property tomorrow. Um, Good. Too. <laughs> funny you should ask. I don't know what that means. Um, for those who have been around the center for a long time, we are housed in the basement of one of our district courts. <clears throat> and the county has provided a space for the DRC for more than 20 years now. And it's been a real blessing that we have not had to pay rent. So there are two things about this adventure. One, we've got to figure out how to pay our rent and we got to find a place to do it. So we were looking at uh, space 
that is that will have free parking and a bus line. And we connect it with a realtor um, whom we know, a very community-oriented um, man, and he's identified a few properties for us. And Jermaine and I are visiting. We have two that we're going to visit tomorrow um, and see where it takes us. Okay, so, if, yeah, if, best case scenario, we'll have a new address by July or August. Worst case scenario, we'll keep looking. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we need space. We're growing. Uh, with growth, you know, comes <clears throat> problems. And we have new people on the staff, and I have nowhere for them to sit. <laughs> and we want to have a space that will have a conference room. So if you all want to do an in-person, or if a case is an in-person case, people can drive or take the bus, park for free, and we'll have a conference room for you. <laughs> yep. Oh, well, thank you so much, Belinda. Um, just a couple quick reminders. Um, our next session, our next Lunch and Learn is March 6th, which is a Wednesday at 1130. And our presenter will be Molly Rands, who is from the Lawyers and Judges Assistance Program with the, Mich the State Bar of Michigan. Um, and she's going to talk about compassion fatigue. And also mark your calendar for the Unity Walk, which is will be held on Saturday, J June 8th. Right, Belinda? And was there anything else, Belinda, any training or anything else that I should remind folks of? Not at this time. Okie doke. All righty. Well, so good to see you all. Thank you for your time and attention today. And have a good rest of the afternoon. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Belinda. Bye.